so um I'm just going to ask the questions and you can fight out who, who answers first. Uh, what inspired you to write about Edgar and Adolf? Waggy, go. <laughs> well, uh, I've got another handy prop here. It's not, it, it is actually the hat that I wear all the time. Oh. Bill's got a similar one. Wow, yeah. you've had a hat. Amazing. <laughs> this here is uh, a badge of Edgar Cale. Oh. Uh, and I often wear it because he's a hero. He's a hero of mine, and I know he is now, Phil's too. And one day, I think about three, maybe four years ago, Phil and I and some other friends were having a meal in a cafe, and Phil spotted this badge. And that's literally where it all started. He, he, as is his brilliant instinct for where a story might be. I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Phil, you wondered immediately if there might be a story there. And you asked me to tell you a bit more about Edgar Cale, who was a Dulwich Hamlet footballer in, in the 1920s and 1930s. Um, and I toyed with the idea of writing something about him myself, but I've never written fiction in this way before. I've written for theatre mainly plays. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it was only when Phil and I started talking more that we thought, well, maybe there's, there's a novel in this. Um, yeah. Phil, do you want to take over from there? I think <clears throat> I always get a bit excited by really little daft things. Um, like, like I like writing about war, but often I don't like writing about, I don't like battle scenes. I'm interested mm -hmm. in the stuff that happens because of the war. And, um, and Waggy, Waggy's fanatical about Deutsch Hamlet. And we used to go and watch when I lived in London uh, together. And, and they still sing for him. They yeah. sing, you know, this guy hasn't played for nearly a hundred years. And, and the Dulwich Hamlet fans, in that division they play in, normally there's two or three hundred fans turn up if they're playing an away match. I think that's right, Waggy. But if, if they're at home, Dulwich get about 3,000 in and they're fanatical. They call them the rabble. And they sing for Edgar every week. They sing, Edgar Cale in my heart, keep me Dulwich. Edgar Cale in my heart, I pray, you know, etc., yeah. etc. Et and I just, every time I think of that, it gives me goosebumps. Do you know what I mean? I just think that's, in, it's incredible. This is a non-league side. He was an amateur player. Yet he's, he's sainted down at the Hamlet. And um, the second Waggy started telling me about it, that was it for me. I was in. And because Waggy is so encyclopedic about the club, he knew about the relationship between uh, Dulwich and, and, and Altona, 93. Mm. And... And there was all this wonderful synergy, wasn't the wag, about, about the fact that Edgar, Edgar had managed to play for, for England. And we think, get it right, I always get this wrong, Waggy. What's the thing? He was the last... He was the last non-league player to play for England. So there, there were amateur players that played for the national team after that. But uh, a massive achievement to be a non-league player and play for the full England team. He played three times and scored twice in three games. Yeah, you Which can't is, imagine that happening now, can you? No, it just, it there's happen. no chance of it happening. No, no chance. And so there was this wonderful synergy with, within Alton and 93, their, their, their sort of partnered club. Um, there was Ed, 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 sorry, Adolf Jaeger, who had represented Germany. Was it at the Olympics, Wag, where he represented them? He may well have done, but he played for the national team quite a few times, 16 or 17 times, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, so he was a more regular uh, national team player. And although also an amateur, I think all clubs at that time in Germany were amateurs. So he, he was actually playing for a top club at that time, Alton mm -hmm. 93, who are now on a very similar level to Dulwich, which is level four or five or six in the, in the football pyramid. Mm -hmm. So that, that friendship, I mean, there is, a, there is a, a partnership between those two clubs that exist today, but it comes absolutely out of the, the friendship between two fans. Yeah. Um, the, the two clubs played against each other in 1925 randomly and we, we cover this in the novel uh, and but that's the story of that match it was just one of the matches that Dulwich played on a tour of Europe uh, and it was pretty much forgotten it was written down in record books but nobody really knew much about it until about 10 years ago and a, a, a Dulwich fan was visiting the Altona club uh, and, and an Altona club just, you know, in a very friendly way, just said, hello, who are you? What are you doing here? Um, and they got chatting. And it's from that very, from that moment that the friendship um, emerged between the two clubs because they looked back at the record books and the history and they discovered there was a connection, just a very brief connection between the two clubs. But that friendship now is very, very real. 
uh, and lots of new friendships have, have um, been born out of it. And so the, the, the other inspiration, I guess, is friendship because mm. Phil and I, uh, we've been friends, uh, despite how young we look, we've been friends for 27 years. Uh, <laughs> really good friends. And we also wanted, we, I, I, I think we were both uh, inspired or, or just nudged towards telling a story about friendship, I think. Uh, and that, and th these two, Edgar and Adolf, felt like a really good place to start and the clubs that they played for. Yeah. So if you could meet either, who would it be and what would you ask them? What would you like to <laughs> talk to them about? I think I'd like to well, meet I think Edgar. that's easy. <laughs> go on, Phil. Go on, Ed. No, you go first. Well, no, I'm just going to say it's easy because there's two of us and there's two of them, so we can be absolutely fair. Go <laughs> you can all go, to get, all, go, all go out and, and chat together. <laughs> yeah. Waggy's, Waggy's German is a lot better than mine, so <laughs> uh, Jaeger. Uh, yeah, I got a few German words, so I'd, I'd be very happy to chat with Adolf, uh, and maybe Phil could chat with Edgar, and then we could we could all meet up for a kick about. That what, would be good. what What would you like to ask them though? If you could ask them anything about about their career, or about their friendship in the novel. For me, it's that thing that we touch on a little bit in the book, which is that notion of one player, one team for your whole career. You know, mm -hmm. now if you do that these days as a footballer, they put a, they put a, a statue of you outside the stadium. Do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? Um, and, and especially, you know, with no, with both of them, with Adolf and Edgar, you know, they could have gone on to play for the top clubs in their respective countries, but they chose not to. And, and part of that is to do with the amateur nature of, of the game then. And they had to earn a living. And there was always this fear that one bad tackle uh, and that was it. Your, your livelihood was over. But um, I, I'm fascinated by that notion of loyalty um, mm. uh, uh, to, to the club. You know, Edgar, you know, we, from what we can gather, Waggy, he had lots of offers, didn't he? Um, yeah. and, and he chose just to stay where he was. So... I want, I'd want to ask him about about that and about what he felt he missed out on or did he feel he didn't miss out on anything? How did he feel when he was the only non-league player? You know, it's, it's ridiculous. We now, if a championship player gets picked for England, you kind of go, what? You know, even if it's a goalkeeper. Mm. So if the fact that he was four or five divisions lower than those teams and still got picked is extraordinary. So I'd like to ask him about that, I think. Mm. about you, Wag? I think I'd like to ask him about the, the particular match that started it all, the match in 1925, which Dulwich won 4-1. Uh, I'd like to know, I think we've got a rough idea that there were, that there were sort of 10,000 people there, plus maybe. Um, I'd like to know what the atmosphere was like, and wander around that crowd at that match. And we, the club sort of uh, recreated it to some extent two years ago, uh, another match between the two clubs. Uh, which which was organised by these two fans who started this, the friendship, and the score was exactly the same four one to Dulwich. So. <laughs> Brilliant, isn't it? Maybe they were looking down. <laughs> it's <on>. Amazing. <laughs> so, when writing, you've been obviously written this a historical novel. How do you make decisions about what details you keep in and which ones you're going to fictionalise? Well, we had a bit of backwards and forwards with with Ailsa, our editor, about this mm -hmm. um, because it took quite a long time for. Also, I think, to establish what the parameters were. I mean, we were really quite um, adamant that the names weren't going to change, we, that they had to be called Adolf, Jaeger and Edgar Kale, that they had to be involved with those two clubs. We wanted to, to touch on the game that Waggy's talked about, the 1925 match, which is the way we introduced them to each other in the novel. But aside from that, we were very, very aware, weren't we, mate, about just making it entertaining, first and foremost. Um, you know, the, the, I think the best, your, my only or our only job as writers is to ask the question, what if? And, 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 and when you speak to writers like Marcus Sedgwick, who I think are like up there as the best kind of teen writers, their, their only rule is don't be boring. Mm. And so it's that thing of, okay, how can we weave a narrative around this that's, that's riveting, that will have a good educational slant? Because we were also adamant, I think, from word go, that we wanted this to be a book that reached readers that were either reluctant or that had issues with reading due to dyslexia. So, we, wasn't it, from word go wag, that was the case, I think, mate, wasn't it? Yeah, and, and I very much took my cue from Phil on that because he's far more experienced in writing for, for the age group uh, than I am. But 
I feel like, correct me if I'm wrong, mate, but I feel like we sort of gave ourselves permission uh, to be inspired by them, not just in writing the book in the first place, but, but in what we then did with the material of their own lives that we, that we knew about. And there's, there's lots of things we don't know about. And somehow, I hope, we've been true to who they really were mm. by creating characters that are really true and believable. Uh, you know, living, breathing, real people, rather than cutouts yeah. of old-fashioned footballers, if that makes any sense. So maybe yeah. by by uh, using changing some of the facts if we needed to for the story, may, maybe somehow in a funny way, that's also true to them because, as Phil said, we wanted we want to create believable characters and keep the readers with us and and, and make the story you know an adventure and exciting and true uh, it, to, to itself. Uh, if that makes any sense. We yeah. wanted to keep in things like the the smoking and the drinking as mm. well, because, and again, you know, we, there was a little bit of backwards and forwards about what's <laughs> Um But, you know, the fact is, you know, these lads at half time would be sitting there in the dressing room having a cigarette, you know, and it's crazy when you think about it now, you know, I mean, um, footballers would be absolutely vilified, you know, if they were mm. spotted even drinking after a match, never mind having a, having a cigarette. So we wanted to, to, to be quite clear that, and, and to educate, not in a heavy handed way, but show the younger readers that life was very different as well for them. You know, it was, it was a very different set of sort of social values around sport. Yeah, I think that idea of, of sort of grounding it in, the, in that time period and, and making it true to the context, because I, I, can, I can remember reading those bits and thinking, oh, I'm not sure about the drinking and smoking. But actually, you're right, within the context of the novel and the context of being inspired by these, these characters, inspired by the time, that's, that's what needs to be there. And it's that, that balance, isn't it, of remaining true to the things that need to remain real and being creative with the bits that are going to bring the story alive, I guess. I mean, we, we wanted to hold them up, I think, most importantly, as the heroes that they were. You know, we weren't interested in, in, I mean, you know, we wanted to show that they had flaws and that they were human. But, you know, for us, this book's a celebration, I think, you know, of them, of the clubs uh, and, and of, of their legacy, really. I think, I think it's also connected to the, the fact that there's two of us as well in, in, in actually the mechanics of, of writing it. I, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed the fact that there were two of us writing this book because there, there are two historical older characters in there and two clubs, you know, it's, it, there's lots of twos. But also it meant practically that we could keep, somehow uh, keep a check on each other, that might be the wrong way to say it, or, or just uh, nudge, uh, remind, uh, tease, whatever you might want to do to the other one, or, or just say, hold on a minute, is that the right decision? This is, it's, it's almost, you know, I'm, I'm sure all writers probably have some someone or something over their shoulder somehow saying, are you sure about that? Are you sure about that? Uh, is that the right thing to do? What about this? What about this? We could do that to each other. Mm. Um, and on this, in, in the, uh, thinking about them as real people, it's probably true to say that I was a bit more, hold on, Phil, which we're changing that fact. Is that the right thing to do? Hold on. It, it, which felt very health, healthy and useful. Um, yeah. We had someone on each other's back a little bit in a really useful way. Yeah, well, we were going to ask about the, the process, how you did it. So kind of what was the process? Did it change as, as you wrote? Did it, how did it develop? And is it something you'd consider doing again? It, it, it only changed in the end because of COVID. Uh, right. <laughs> but each of the drafts that we did um, followed the same process which was a really clear one. And for me, it was, uh, uh, I had more fun writing this book than I've written, have writing any other book because to get to write it with one of your best mates is, is a real privilege. And so it was always the same, Wag, wasn't it? Waggy would very kindly um, come up here. So he'd jump on the train, often on either a Thursday night or a Friday morning. He'd get here. Um, and once he got here, we would take the dog out and we would walk the dog up to the Robin Hood pub or the Hare and Hounds pub, and we would take a laptop. And we'd do a bit of walking first. We wouldn't go yeah. direct to the pub. <laughs> <laughs> At least 45 minutes. But we, we basically sat. We, we sat, or we walked and we talked, and then we sat and we talked. And 
we can, I mean, I think we worked incredibly quickly on, on the, the process was very quick. Mm -hmm. So by the time Waggy had think, gone home on the Sunday, so he'd had a couple of nights with us, you know, we'd, we'd thrashed out what we saw as um, a chapter by chapter synopsis. Mm -hmm. Now I never ever work like that ever. I just don't, I'm a, I'm not a planner. I'm a seat of the pants writer. I'd like to see where the ride is going to take me. But for this, it, I think we both decided, didn't we mate, that it had to work in that quite stru structured way. Yeah. Yeah. It's also, it was extremely helpful to me because I, I have not written fiction like this before. This is a, this is a first stab at a novel or, or novella. And uh, so Phil's helping me through that to a certain extent. So, so to, to see, to, to, to have laid out a, a pretty tight structure about what might happen in each scene uh, was really useful so that when I got home and thought, okay, I, so basically then we divided it up and took half each. I'll take chapter one, Phil takes two, I take three, he takes four, for a first stab at it. Mm -hmm. When I came to write my first stabs, it was very helpful because I could, I had written down probably, you know, uh, three or four lines about what might happen and what the heart of that scene might be. So I knew I was, I knew what I was aiming for very mm -hmm. clearly. So it was, it was, then we could, then as, as Phil said, very quickly had a first stab at each of the chapters that we've been tasked to, to have a go at. And then swap them. So we're immediately doing a quick edit on each yeah. other's first goes. Uh, that really, that felt like it worked well. And, and it's very, uh, as Phil says, it's a, it's a quick way of getting through it. The task doesn't seem so huge. Each task is just deal with this bit of homework. If I don't do it, Phil's going to be on my back saying, where's yours? I've finished mine. You know, and then when we're both done, we swap and move on. Now, that was really helpful to me and, and thoroughly enjoyable. It felt like we were making progress every day it was it was um what was interesting for me though was that it felt like the voice and um, it didn't for me when i read it it doesn't feel like two voices it feels like one voice and mm. and you know it wasn't that one of us took the present day scenes and one of us took the flashbacks it absolutely wasn't that you know what where, where waggy has masses of um uh, experience not just with poetry and stuff but also and playwrights but he's with his journalism so when it came to things like the match reports Mm. He had a very natural eye about, you know, what, what works there. It, I, I, I don't want to sound like silly, but it, I found it really, it, it was a really emotional process for me. I found it, I found it more emotional than any other book that I've written. And, and, and I've got more strong memories about the writing process as a result than I have with any other book that I've written. So I, I remember, you know, I like, give you a very brief example. So the first weekend Waggy came up, um, I couldn't sleep the Sunday morning. So I, I got up and now that we hadn't agreed this, I got up and I wrote chapter one and mm -hmm. I printed it out and I slid it under his door before he woke up. So do you know what I mean? It's little daft things like that. that <laughs> yeah. It sounds daft, but in terms of a book about friendship, I think it's really pertinent. I couldn't have written this book with another writer that I didn't know. Couldn't have done it. And I wouldn't have done it. It wouldn't have made any sense. It sounds like um, this this was a sort of a theme and a subject matter that really excited you and grabbed grabbed you and, and sort of involved you emotionally in the story. And how important do you think that is when you're writing about something? Does it does it always make it easier, do you think? Well, yeah, uh, well, it, it felt, yeah, as I say, this is the first stab at this type of writing for me. It felt absolutely essential that, that we were, A, um, as Phil says, trying to celebrate Edgar and Adolf, who are in one sense our main characters, but in the other sense, the boy, Addy, who's our teenage protagonist, mm. was, was uh, of course, it is, is the main character and was, was so vital. And, and Phil's to it and to, to it being, you know, to us telling it honestly and truly, and as you say, being emotionally engaged, because I think we were both well aware and Phil taught me this, uh, sort of talked me through this, that we had to be on an emotional journey with Addy uh, and we, in the writing so that the, and then that would be evident in the reading, we hope, so that everything is through Addy's eyes in the, in the, the, um, the more recent history uh, and that we're learning about the past through Addy's eyes, felt uh, through Addy's eyes and Addy's sense of it felt absolutely vital and uh, 
so yes, the, the emotional engagement started probably for me because of my interest in these two football clubs with Ed Grinadolf, but it became very soon about Addy, um, learning about them through Addy. Uh, I, I suppose that's, that's what we've tried to hold on to. Addy, Addy, Addy was, a, was, was a godsend, really. And um, he wasn't as prevalent. Or, uh, the structure of the book in the first draft was very different to what we've ended up in. It wasn't clear enough, especially for reluctant readers. Uh, mm-hmm. There was too much jumping around in time. So Addy anchored it for us. Um, but he did a lot more than that as well. You know, he wasn't just like a device. Mm-hmm. I think for me, it was really interesting to imagine, to try and think, because we don't think about this. When we learn history at school in World War II, you don't think about, you think about, well, oh, the triumphalism of, we, we won, we beat the Germans, all this nonsense. And what people don't often stop and think about is at, at what cost and, and what legacy that leaves for places like Germany, um, short, medium and long term. You know, how do, I, me and Maggie talked about this, how do, how did the vast majority of the German population feel about the war now, feel about the fact that, that, that so many people went along with Hitler, whether they agreed with him or, or not. Um, and also just the idea of the badge, you know, it felt, Addy was brilliant because of the badge for me, because mm-hmm. the badge was the starting point, seeing that badge on um, Waggy's uh, hat. So to, to come up, it was like a real brilliant, whoa, eureka moment when we came up with the notion of the badge could be the one thing that links it all together, the quest. Because we needed Addy, because actually by the time you get to chapter four, Edgar is the youngest character in the book and he's in his mid-20s. Mm-hmm. So what, what character is there for young readers yeah. to empathise with and aspire to be like? And so Addy was very important in that, his quest and his... Um, his relatability to teenagers, I think, is vital. Just uh, just to go back to the, the emotion as well, as we, we've spoken a lot about friendship, and that's that's part of that as well, I think. Um, and football clubs, it, it's it's a bit. This is part of super readable roller coasters series, and fo- football fans know that life is a roller coaster following your club, <laughs> and particularly at the lower level, and particularly now, you know, in the pandemic. Clubs are absolutely fighting to survive financially, mm. um, but, but supporting a club at that level is a real roller coaster. And and you also you get to know other fans very in a way that you maybe don't at the higher levels. So there's a lot of there's a lot of very close friendships at clubs, and they go through things together. Um, and you know, clubs lose their fans. Um, you know, one of the the key fan that started this friendship, as I mentioned, 10 years ago, very sadly died um, mm. two years ago, uh, last year, sorry. But, um, so, of course, that's, and, and, and you know, I, I, he knew we were writing this book. So for me also, um, he, I know that he would have absolutely loved to read this book and to think that he would have been astonished, but he would have absolutely loved the idea that there is a book about Edgar Kale and Adolf Jäger. He loved both of them. So there's, there's lots of things connected with being a football fan, being a friend, which, which, which of course, are, are the heart of things. And there's, the, yeah. there, there's where the emotion comes from, I guess. Yeah. So what do you hope the readers will take away after reading Edgar and Adolf? Um, <laughs> I mean, for, for me, I think it comes as a writer, or for me as a writer, because I am or I was a reluctant reader as a teenager, and I still class myself as a reluctant reader. There's a lot of types of books that I just won't go near because I get intimidated by it. Do you know what I mean? Mm. I really do. And, and so when, when I work with, or when I've worked with Barrington Stoke, and now I'm working with you guys and Barrington Stoke together, it, it, for me, it's always that hope that it can open the door because mm. I literally felt at 14, like the doors to reading would been shut in my face. I thought people weren't interested in me being a reader. I was reading Roy the Rovers every week, a comic about football, but if I'd have shown that to my teacher, they'd have said, well, you're not a proper reader, son, you know? Mm-hmm. So for me, it's that thing, if we can, if we can give someone the tools uh, for them to go on and try read something else, that would be, that would be, that would be magnificent, I think. I think that'd do for me quite nicely. <laughs> what about you, Wendy? Yeah, and, and to add to that, um, uh, in terms of the, the, the the stuff of the story itself, um, obviously friendship, but also respect is part of it. And mm. we're, we're, we're looking at friendships that survive, uh, or that can survive despite differences, whether they be of language, of culture, 
and also despite huge and horrific obstacles, in this case, the, the Second World War. But um, I hope that uh, some sense of how, that the strength of, of friendship and the importance of respect would, would be something to take away from it, uh, as well as a, a, you know, a good ride, a good adventure, the, the roller coaster that is football and mm -hmm. this book, hopefully.